Mark, it's, um, it's great to have you on the podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, mate. Thank you for inviting me once again. No, no, you're very welcome. It's, um, it's a pleasure to have you back. And um, yeah, I just thought I'd kind of, you know, introduce you and uh, just kind of start out by, um, can we talk about kind of quantum mechanics? Because I remember it, quantum thinking, because in your book that I've got here, um, Understanding the Quantum of Thinking, um, you know, how, how people can kind of apply this to life and kind of like what kind of like inspired you to kind of like do the book, right, like okay. write the book. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about that. Did you want me to do that now or did you, did you have some? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I mean, the book came about really. Um, I think as we said in my last podcast, uh, you know, your last podcast, uh, my life's had no great sort of direction in it. I just sort of, I just sort of do stuff and see where it goes. Mm-hmm. And I got interested. I've always been interested with human behavior. And I, I teach conflict management and or used to do a lot more teaching of conflict management and I got involved with the psychology of that. And it was it was from a desire to want to help people, really, because we had people come on training courses that were nervous and anxious. And I thought, right, how can we better address this? And I went off and started studying NLP. And I, I did some courses with Richard Bandler, which were really interesting. Uh, he's he's an interesting guy to work with, I'll tell you. Yeah. And uh, but during that, he he did some hypnosis stuff, and that fascinated me. So I then went and trained as a cognitive hypnotherapist. And as I was doing the hypnotherapy stuff, I I, I can't actually remember specifically, but I think someone mentioned about quantum mechanics, and I, I read something on it or I saw a video clip. And I thought I've got to look into this, and it was just absolutely fascinating, because the one thing that it talks about is how the smallest things, because quantum comes from you know the Latin to mean small, you know, small small piece of something, small piece of energy, mm. and if you make small changes and you make them consistently over time, the compounded effect of that is going to give you massive change. And that's all about control. So it gives you the ability to take control of the way that you choose to think because things happen to us, you know, I mean, COVID's happened to us. And, you know, when you, when you're my age, so you're a youngster, you can get out in your car, but when you're my age and you've got to be snuck in, you think, right, you know, what can I do? Well, I can't control going out where I want to go. I can't go to restaurants. I can't go to the pub. So, let's do some stuff while I'm here. So what I do is I've gone, you know, re- I've, while I've, this COVID thing has been in, I've been reviewing all the meditative practices, looking at the mindfulness stuff, reviewing the quantum thinking stuff. And all those little things combined uh, will result in big changes later on down the line. You know, everything works that way. It's just the universal law. So that was how I, I got interested in it and, that, and I got started. But I'm, I'm not an academic. Hmm. I think, if, you know, for your listeners there, that if something can understand, I'm not an academic. I don't have a, a degree in anything. So I'm basically self-taught and self-learnt. And the book was a result of me having to put what I was learning into writing because the way I learn is I write things down and I can go back and review it. So I'm a bit old school. And that ended up as a book. And when I was, and the reason it became a book was I was, I got fascinated by it. So I started talking about it on courses and giving people things to do and showing them how they can take control of their thinking and how they can take control of their lives. And they said, have you got anything on this? And I said, well, I've got some notes I've made. And I used to put the notes out and the notes got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the book was produced purely as a as a product of learning. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, I, I've really, you know, I've been reading over it and I really like it. And I think it's great that, you know, you've been able to put those kind of notes together and you know, and build it, you know, to be a book that other people can take, you know, value from. And yeah. I think like you said, with like, you know, mindset and like, you know, people's thinking, a lot of people kind of, I think, don't really know the kind of like what's, what's the word like kind of victims of kind of their own kind of thinking and their, their environment and i think like your book kind of puts it in black and white how to you know how to think and how to you know become better yeah and uh, you know part of the journey with that was when, when i was young i was in the royal navy i, I joined the royal navy I, I loved it i was going to be in there for life uh, so i signed for 22 years and then after 12 years I, i'd become an officer i got commissioned and the funny thing was, I didn't, I didn't want to be an officer, but they kept talking me into it. So in the end, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So I did it. Um, and I, was, I went for pilot. Which, and the, the, the agreement was, if I didn't pass pilot, I could go into this other role that they we'd agreed on. And I didn't pass pilot. I was useless. And um, so I said, I'll, I'll go for this other role. And they said no. So they, they reneged on their word. Now, for me, that was quite a, a big thing because, you know, I believed in all the ethos and the officer's words, you know, is his bond and all this sort of stuff. I was so angry that I resigned and I resigned my commission and walked out the door and I was 4,000 pounds in debt um, and living in a bedsit. So I went from being 
a commissioned officer in the senior service where you had waiters wait, wait on you and everything else to being literally a bed sit away from being homeless with no money. So I started to, to, to work, you know, I was selling insurance door to door. And then I got a job with Apple computers, became hugely successful with that uh, by luck more than anything else. And then I bought a business and I met my wife and we, we got married and I, I bought a business and I lost a lot of money, I ended up 80,000 pounds in debt. And it was at that point in my life, uh, if people are listening to this and they're, they're feeling low, then they can learn something from this, hopefully. Uh, you know, I actually contemplated hanging myself from a tree. Um, I thought, I'm done, because I'm old school. You know, man's the breadwinner sort of thing. I, my, mm. I, couldn't, earn, I couldn't earn any money. I, I'd got us 80,000 pounds into debt. And I thought, right, you know, what do I do with this? And then someone gave me a set of tapes, and it was a Tony Robbins set of tapes. And I, the, he, he actually said to me, take these it might help you he said I bought them he said I don't want them he said it's a bit American happy clappy for me he said but you might like them so I had nothing to do so I used to listen to these tapes and it was something that Tony Robbins kept saying about taking control and it starts with the way you think so I started to apply the principles of what he spoke about on that on that audio course and I wore these tapes out by the way I had to buy another set I would just listen to them all the time but I borrowed another 30,000 pounds to start the business and within 18 months we basically got into ourselves into a position where we were paying everything off and we were making money. And, and well, you know, you've heard of the secret, you know, this thing where, you know, if you think about things, it comes your way and it's, it's true. It, it is true. Um, but it, it's, it's not as simple as that. Uh, you know, if you think you're going to get a million pounds just by wishing a million pounds, it ain't going to happen. Um, but because my focus changed uh, on what, in the way I was thinking, I started to notice more things that would be of benefit to me. So I met a, a guy called Nigel Lobb um, and he, he was a bank manager for the Midland Bank and he'd retired and he just came into, you know, my life and he said, I can help you with this stuff. He said, we'll sort the banks out. And that happened. And then I, I started teaching and I got jobs teaching um, self-defense and, and things were coming. And the more I became productive in my thinking, the more my thinking became more positive, more functional, the more beneficial things were happening. You know, so that's where the beginning was, really. It started from quite a dark place. Mm. no it's uh, i think it's you know really like kind of motivating you know listening to that and you know, hearing you know what where that place that you know, that you was in you know you're in eighty thousand pounds debt and you know like it's not the best pl you know the best place in the world to be is it when you're in that situation but you was able to kind of turn that around by gaining you know an understanding on how your thinking works and to manifest and to put in the work to kind of get the things that you know you wanted to create that life that you wanted and those those tapes kind of was like that kind of catalyst to do that yeah yeah absolutely and uh, i still remember the name of the guy again a guy called colin um he, he gave me those tapes so colin if you're listening to this mate or watching this thanks for that but uh yeah but it, it just goes to show you know I, i'm not a as i said i'm not an educated man i don't have any degrees mm. so, but if i if i'm able to apply the thinking and the principles and make it work then anyone can do the same thing you know it's mm. not rocket science it's, it's just it's and the universal laws this is the thing these laws have been around for ever since human beings walked the planet you know, the Buddhists have been practicing some of these, these techniques for 2,600 odd years, you know, nearly 3,000 years. So it's not difficult, you know, and it's there. And, and if they're doing it, they must have been doing it for a reason. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, it, it, it's about focus. It's about being, a, you know, having that, that positive focus, that, that positivity in the way you think and using your awareness in a way in which you're going to look for things that you want to actually appear, mm. but then come into your, into your consciousness because it's all there already. Mm. And I think as well with like what's happening in the world and, you know, the kind of strange times that we're in, I think it's, you know, quite a good thing if people get into this, you know, this kind of stuff like now, because it will, like you said, help them, you know, shift their emotional state and their, you know, their life probably, you know, create oh. less, less anxiety. Well, let's, let's look at it. I mean, you, you've got literally two choices. You can, hate the situation we're in and get angry about it and do nothing about it apart from blame everyone um, and blame society and blame whoever or whatever started this thing and become very negative and, and just get completely down on the whole thing or you can do something about it now when we did our last podcast together I, I use a phrase where you control what you can control and what you can't control don't worry about so I, I can't control the virus 
and I can't control the environment. I can't control the fact that pubs are shut and I can't go to my favorite restaurants anymore. You know, I can't control the fact that we can't have our children around. But what I can control is what I do about it, uh, my mm. attitude towards it and what I choose to do. So I've now, and, it, and it's been a blessing. You know, the benefits of it is now I can, I can practice my mindfulness. I can get into my meditations. I can read more. I can study more. I've got more time to reflect on the business. I can spend more. This is the first time in 30 years of business that this is the longest period I've spent at home with my wife. You know, so there's a massive benefit there, you know, so and that's my, my benefits. Now, you know, if someone else in the same situation, they've got they've got a similar choice. They either do nothing or they do something and they, they, they take what they've got and make best use of it. Mm. Yeah, and no, I think that they're really good points. And I think, like you said, you know, you can't control the things that you kind of can't control. Like you said, like the news, the media, you know, who, whatever started this. Um, you know, the fellow can't see certain people, but you know, like I said, there were these kind of silver linings and benefits to it where you know, we people might be with their family more, you know, their partner, um, and they've got that time to, like I said, reflect and probably you know, work on things that they didn't have the time to work on as well. And, um, like I really like your business because it's the um, how do I pronounce it properly, NF, NFPS, the yeah. National Federation for Personal Safety, yeah, and like. But how did you kind of um, get into that? So that's kind of like through through this, after doing the book and kind of understanding, you kind of just merged into that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, that was a, another interesting story. I, I went on a, I went to a seminar once, and I listened to a guy talking because I was in the prison service, I was a hostage negotiator and you know, prison officer. And I was leaving that to set my own business up. And I went on seminars to learn more from various industry experts. And I went to this seminar and this guy was talking about anger and aggression. And it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But he didn't go into the violent bit and talk about violence. So I stayed behind at the end and I said, are you going to do another one of these on violence? And he said, no, it's not our area. We're not specialized in that. And I said, that's a shame because that's what I want to learn more about. And he was very shrewd, actually. He said, well, what do you do? So I said, well, I'm in the prison service at the moment. I'm a hostage negotiator. I've done this, I've done that. And they gave me a card and said, look, come and see us. So we booked a time for me to go to the offices. And they, they offered me a job to go on a speaking tour around the country. And I went, no. And they said, why? I said, look, I said, I'm just a bloke. I said, you know, I can't stand up the front and do what you do. I don't have the qualifications. And they said, well, yeah, but you're, you're doing it. So we'll use your experience and we'll market you. And we'll, I think it was 18 gigs around the UK. So I said, no, I don't want to do it. And, and they, they slipped me a bit of paper. And they said, have a look at that. So I opened it up and, and there was a, a, some money, a financial figure in there. So I laughed at them and I said, you want me to 18 venues around the country for that much money? I said, you've got to be joking. He said, no, that's the cost per day. And I went, I'll do it. And you know, when you haven't got anything, it's a great motivator. So I did it, never having done it before. And I learned on the go. But mm. as a result of that, I had, I had people giving me their business cards and saying we want to work, work with you and train with you so at the end of this this 18 tour this 18 event event tour i was sat in a in a restaurant with my friend john steadman with a great big box full of business cards and i said what do we do and he, he said let's set up a company and i went all right so as we did we were in his favorite restaurant we got drunk we fell asleep and when we woke, woke up in the restaurant by the way the words, <laughs> this is true the words the national federation for personal safety were written on a napkin and that's how we start the business. <laughs> oh, that's class. Yeah. That's, that's amazing though, isn't it? Like you said, you was kind of given the opportunity to, um, you know, use your experience and to, to help, you know, like other businesses and people to use your services. And it's, it's pretty amazing how that kind of like works, works out. And it just shows you, doesn't it? You know, sometimes those opportunities are kind of like presented to us and it's up to us to just kind of, don't jump into the unknown isn't it yeah and the, the opportunity this is the thing the opportunities are there i mean if you go back to the book quantum thinking you know einstein talks about all realities existing as one in, in the same place at the same time and it, you know and you have superposition in, in quantum mechanics so everything you want to become is already in existence there you just got to make the decision to take you on that route um and if you know if, if people are watching this are thinking i don't know what to do with my life just go and do something it will take you somewhere you know take a positive step somewhere take a chance and when i had no money and nothing to bargain with this opportunity came up and i just took it because i needed the money and that opened up another opportunity which opened up another opportunity uh so you know it, it's all there uh, but you know and as i said you've got two choices in life you do something or you do nothing 
And mm. whatever you do more of, you get more of. So if you do nothing, you get more of nothing. If you do something, you get more of something. And the other thing is as well, a really important factor is I don't worry about how it's going to happen. And I, I don't worry about what the process are. I don't, I don't write business plans, by the way. Okay. I don't have a five-year plan. I just let it go. I just think I want to do that. And, and I focus on it and I meditate on it and I think about it and I just let it go. And, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it sounds a bit brash and a bit weird, but if you read books on mindfulness, on meditation, and if you look at what successful people have done historically, even Olympic athletes, an Olympic athlete will train for years to get to, to an Olympic final. And on the day of that race, for example, they don't worry about winning. They say, I've, I've done everything I can do to get me here. Let's just see where that gets me. And most of the people who adopt that attitude actually end up winning. The ones who want to win, who really want to win, don't win. Because they, 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 they're holding on to it in the hope they don't lose it. And when you hold on to something in the hope of not losing it, you've got loss in your mind. You have a fortress mentality. Mm. Yeah. So you've got, you've got to let things go. And just try it mm. and go for it. Yeah, no, that's powerful. And I, and I really agree. And I think, like, kind of reminds me of when I just kind of started the podcast. I was like, I'm just going to do it and just see where it goes kind of thing. I'm yeah. not, like you said, I've not got this kind of set, you know, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. And it's taken you somewhere. I've seen yeah. your interview. You've interviewed some really interesting people. That's going to take you somewhere. Now, if you hadn't have done anything, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. You know, and the most important time in anyone's life is what they're doing at that moment in their life right now. Yeah. So, you know, if someone said to me, what's, what's the most important thing in your life right now? It's this, because we're doing this. What mm. I did five minutes ago, or what I'm going to do in five minutes time isn't relevant. And, mm. and people spend a lot of time, you know, even, even when they're doing something, their minds wandered off and their minds thinking about what they did yesterday or something that may have annoyed them, or they're thinking about what they're going to have for tea this evening or what, what they're going to do tomorrow or when is COVID going to end. Mm. That's not living in the moment. And what you're doing is you're giving away that moment in time to, a, to, to you, you know, you, you might just letting it wander. Well, if you focus on what you're doing, there are massive benefits in that, huge benefits. In fact, I, I wrote some down. Let me just find them on here. Nice um, uh, where is it now? Let me just... Uh... Yeah. This, you know, pe people who focus, if, if you're doing some mindfulness meditation, for example, right, then th functions that are vital to your well-being and quality of life, such as perspective taking, attention, regulation, learning and memory, emotional regulation and threat appraisal can all be positive influenced by thinking in a more positive way. Uh, you know, it, it reduces the, the effect of psychological stress. Uh, and, and some of the studies that have been done at universities, like the University of Wisconsin study, it showed that people who had psoriasis healed at four times the rate of those who received the same treatment but didn't meditate. In corporate settings, if, you know, if businesses are thinking about, and I'm talking about mindfulness meditation here, and some people think, oh, that's just sitting there doing nothing. It's actually not. It's, it's sit, mm. sitting there and focusing on what you're doing at that moment in time. And that's really hard to do, actually. It's mm. much, much hard, harder than actually doing nothing. Uh, but, you you know, people in corporate settings found that employees who, who were applying mindfulness techniques and meditation techniques, you know, they were handling the emotions of frustration, anxiety much more effectively. And an interesting study done with this, this university showed that people who were given the flu vaccine at the end of eight weeks of mindfulness training they had a significantly stronger antibody response than those who didn't meditate, you know, and there's other studies going on here, you know, mindfulness can help, you know, meditation can help reduce loneliness. Now we know during COVID, for example, many people are suffering with loneliness hmm. and loneliness is, is a major risk factor, particularly in the elderly. And it, you know, when people feel lonely and they feel that they, there's no one there, that it, it affects the expression of how the, the genetics in their body are expressed and that that increases inflammation and inflammation is a core element in in diseases such as cancer cardiovascular disease and alzheimer's disease mm. mindfulness meditation reduces all that so it helps you live longer you know it, it's a it's an amazingly powerful thing so you know when, when i talk about this stuff i'm not talking about it from being some wishy-washy let's sit on the floor with our legs crossed you know put our hands on our zone out and just just say on you're actually focusing on what you're doing at the moment in time you're just becoming aware of everything that's around you and that is that is quite a hard discipline to do but the benefits of it in terms of our health 
in terms of, of our relationships, in terms of if you've got a business, in terms of, of your business success, are massive because it's giving you the ability to take control of stuff that's going to have a positive effect. So, you know, people say to me sometimes, you know, they say, oh, you, you do positive thinking and, you know, but it's, 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 all, it's all rubbish. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. And they go, well, you agree with me? I said, no. I said, but if you believe it, then it must be. I said, but I know what's happening in your mind right now and I know what's happening in my mind right now. I said, and I'd rather have mine than yours because the toxins you're producing just by the way you're thinking are toxifying every one of the 60 to 100 trillion cells in your body and you're polluting it. You're polluting yourself. No one else can do that for you. You have to do that yourself. So this is the power it gives you. You know, when, when you apply principles of, you know, I call it quantum thinking, but you can call it, you know, mindfulness, stress relation, uh, reduction. You can call it meditation, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's just a name. It's what you do that's important. Hmm. Yeah, now there's some really powerful points. And I think, like you said, with, with like, um, you know, stress and inflammation and people focusing on, the things and not being in the moment causes all these kind of inflam inflammatories and you know anxiety and um, cortisol in the system isn't it and it all kind of interlinks and it's all kind of joined together you know with like mental health and people's physical health and all the external factors it kind of all adds together doesn't it and kind of makes people stress and not well and it's crazy that you said um, people who, who did practice mindfulness kind of had more antibodies produced in their system and had, you know had, wasn't ha having information and in these kind of things yeah i mean the buddhists have got yeah i mean all, all this stuff comes from buddhism and the buddhist monks have got different levels of meditation and some of their tantric stuff is very powerful and, and they can go in, into you know arctic temperatures sit at the top of a snow tip covered mountain where, and I've, I've, I've worked in the Arctic when I was in the Navy, I worked in the Arctic Circle. The amount of clothing we had to wear to not get hypothermia was, was tremendous. Buddhist monks sit out there with nothing but a sheet on them and meditate. And they can increase their body core temperature up to the effect that they're hot and the, the, the sheets are absolutely you know, boiling. And what they do is they, they, they take, they actually don't, they don't just let them meditate, they take cold, wet sheets that are out in freezing cold conditions, put them on the monks, and the monks dry them out. That, that's that you know. so you've got the ability to do this with your mind this this mind is a hugely powerful thing you know so if you can do that reducing inflammation isn't a problem mm. you know healing psoriasis isn't a problem i mean if john stebbins watching this he'll vouch for this I, I was in northern ireland many years ago and a gentleman came on a course with us and he always wore long sleeves and his body's all covered up and one day it was really hot. And we said, take your thing. He said, no, I'm embarrassed. And he pulled it up and he, and he had rashes all over his arms, all over his body. He had some massive psoriasis. And they wanted to trial him on drugs. And they said, but we'll give you these drugs, but there's going to be a, there could be an adverse effect where it could affect your liver. Hmm. And he said, what do I do? I said, well, I don't know. I said, so we said, look, let's do some hypnosis stuff and see where it goes. So we hypnotized him and gave him some suggestions. And John will vouch for this. You could see that you could see the rashes clearing up whilst he was under hypnosis. Now, this is not ma magic. You know, they, they, there's been people have, who've had surgery under hypnosis without anesthetic. You know, it, it, it's a powerful tool. But what is hypnosis? Focused awareness. What's mindfulness? Focused awareness. What's meditation? Focused awareness. It's all it is. It's all the same thing. Yeah, no, it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, like the power, you know, of our minds and the states that we can kind of take ourselves to you know, through meditation, through mindfulness, through these practices and how kind of, um, you know, like kind of how we are kind of creating the stress and that, you know, it's down to us at the end of the day of how we kind of manage our emotions. And like I said, um, you know, people's focus. And I think it just shows, doesn't it, how, how it's powerful and how it can be used to, you know, to heal yourself. Like you said, those guys kind of rashes disappearing. Yeah. And if you, if you don't control your emotions, then you become addicted to them. Mm. So when people say, it's just the way I am, I'm just an angry person. No, you just practice it to the point where now you can become angry without a trigger, you know, without being aware of it. Mm. You know, and, you know, you're sat in your car. Driving is a prime example. When, when people drive their car and they drive from point A to point B, if you said that person, what sort of things did you see en route? Well, they can't remember. 
you know, how many telephone boxes did you see? Or you know, how many yellow cars? Can't remember because they're, they're on an automated process of driving a car. So they're not aware of, of what's going on around them. And people are in this trance all the time. You know, it's, it's a social hypnotic trance. And I, I, I have people watch now, you know, I, I always have done, to be honest with you. And I go to London very infrequently, um, and now even less. But when I used to go to London, I used to, I used to just sit on the side of the roads and watch people. And you'd see people walking down the road with the earphones in, and you could see that their, their eyes were open, but they weren't awake, if that makes sense. You know, they weren't aware of anything that was around them, you know, at all. They were just on, on the fact that they're going to go from point A to point B. And if that's a 30-minute journey, then not being aware of those 30 minutes, 30 minutes have just gone out of their life. They just wasted 30 minutes of their life. And, and we've got now in society, you know, increasing mental health problems. Um, we've, we've got mental health first aiders going into, into businesses now try, trying to help staff do this. And it's a good thing on one aspect. But the other thing is, if they're saying, well, you know, you could have this or you could have that, that brings that into their awareness and itself justifies the way they feel. So they think about it more. And the more you think about stuff, the more the neurons come together in your brain. So by the way, you know, so thinking creates a physical connection in the brain. It creates physical networks. And the bigger those networks become, because the more you think about something, the more those networks grow, the more permanent whatever it is you're thinking about becomes in your life. So musicians, for example, who can play a guitar or a violin, they have larger neural networks in their brain because they practice it more. People who read Braille have larger neural networks in their brain for Braille than people who don't because they practice it more. And guess what? People who are miserable have larger neural networks in their brain because they practice being miserable more and people who are depressed and people who are happy have the same thing. So it, it's, it, it's deciding what you want to be or who you want to be and then working towards that. You know, it, and it, it's you have we all have this control. It's it's a phenomenal thing. Mm. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it is it is fascinating, like you said, how you know our mind and what we choose to focus on and what we choose to think kind of you know grows the more focus that you know we give to that. And like you said, you see that with like musicians and sports people, and I, I've seen I like watching people do skateboard or BMX, and you see them get a skateboard and they they do all these tricks, and it's like you said they've built that kind of neural network around that and i think it just shows you how important it is to kind of focus on things that matter and things that you know are important yeah i mean jack nicholas the famous golfer you know he was he he, he said before i actually hit the shot for real i practiced it ten thousand times in my mind so he knows where that shot's going to go now, it might not get there first time, but he's going to be more likely to get nearer to where he wants to be than not getting nearer to be because of the visualization process he goes to. So if you, if you look at sports psychology, you focus on having already achieved what it is you want to achieve. So if you want to be the fastest man at 100 meters or fastest person at 100 meter sprint, you visualize yourself going through that, that, that tape first. Okay, And you do that time and time and time again until it becomes real you you, you adopt the sensations you, you, you adopt the smells you, you adopt the muscle tone by the way your body doesn't know the difference because they've done experiments with athletes where they, they've had them wired up where they're running on a tra- on a track or on a, on a running machine and then they've taken them off the running machine sat them in a chair wired them up and got them to visualize it and you get the same electrical imp- impulses coming out of the body as if they're actually doing it because the brain doesn't know the difference between perception and reality now, if you do that in sport and you're more likely to, to be more successful at whatever your sport is, how do you do that in business? Hmm. It's the same thing. So if, if you want, I don't know, let's, let's measure it financially. If you say, I, I want to earn £100,000 a year, you have to see yourself with a £100,000 a year lifestyle in your head and you've got to repeat it and you've got to practice it and you've got to go through it and you've got to get all the senses involved with this and you focus on that and the networks in your brain come together as though you've actually done it. Now, if the mind believes you've done it, then all its job is then is to take you on route to make it happen. Hmm. And that's what you let go. You just say, well, go and find out how I do it. And that's the point you let go. And all the athletes that do this, as I said to you before, when they get to the track on race day, they've done the work up here. They've done the work on the physical side. They just let it go then. and They let fate take its course. Hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly it. And I think like, I, I agree with you, and I think it's so it's so amazing, you know, when you think about it, and you think about how we can create, you know, the life that we that we want through, you know, manifestation, thinking about it, you know, visualizing it happening, and those senses, and then you know, putting in that work. And I think 
why why do you think like a lot of some people don't do that? Do you think it's because they probably don't believe it? It's it's possible, or do you you know like, do you think they're not disciplined enough? Like what you know what kind of stop do you think stops people from doing that? Because I mean, well, pe- people are easily influenced, um, and they're in- easily influenced by their friends and their peers. So, I mean, when I started doing this stuff, I didn't tell anyone I was doing it. I, I used to actually sit in the toilet. I didn't even tell my wife. I used to sit in the toilet in my house and write down my affirmations in a book. I mean, I think she thought I had a bad stomach for years. But I used to write, <laughs> write, them, down, write them down in a book. I was, and I wouldn't tell anyone because you, you, you're embarrassed about what they're going to say. Um, so if someone goes home and says, oh, I've seen this stuff and I'm going to meditate for 45 minutes a day and you know, I'm going to have a more positive outlook on life, how many naysayers are going to shout them down? It's going to happen. And one of the reasons I believe that people do that is, is they don't want to see other people succeed. Because mm. if, if, if one of their friends can succeed, that means they could do it too if they're willing to put the work in. But if they can drag their friend down, then it proves that the system doesn't work. So there's one possible reason why they don't do it. And people like to be, you know, they like, they like to have friends. They like to, to you know, to be liked. Mm. If they go off and do something different, there's a high, high possibility they're going to be different. So they won't be like their friends. Now, to lose your peer group and to be, become different is frightening for some people. Mm. But you know, what's what's the choices? You know, I mean, I, I can remember when I went to join the navy at 16 years old. I can remember standing on the platform of uh, Hayes and Harlington train station, waiting for the train to come to take me to Plymouth, or take me to London to get the train to Plymouth. And as that train pulled in, I was petrified. I thought, well, once I get on this train, there's no going back. And I can remember the doors opening and I was hesitant, but I stepped on the train. And then once I was on the train, it was done. I, I wasn't going to get off. And I got to London, switched trains, went to Plymouth to join the Royal Navy. But the, 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 the fear was there. Hmm. And it would have been very easy for me not to have taken that step and gone home. Because we like what we're used to and we fear change. But, but change is everywhere. You know, I mean... 98% of the atoms in your body that make up your cells, they change every year. 98% of them are different. So when you breathe in, you ingest new atoms. When you breathe out, you exhale, you exhale old ones. When you drink water, you ingest new atoms. When you go to the toilet, you get rid of them. So you're the same person, uh, but different. Every part of you is different. So you could ask the question, if I'm different, why then do we have people who have illnesses that go on for extended periods of time? And the reason is, is you change the machinery, but you don't change the programming. Mm. Yeah. So you pollute the stuff that's coming in. Now, I don't want to say this in, in, in a glib way. But we're, only, we're only doing a short video. Yeah, no, but, of course. Because you know, there's people out there who have suffered from serious illnesses. But if you look at the research out there, applying your mind in these situations, it, it, it may not make you 100% better, but it will have changed your attitude towards what you have. And that's a big factor. That helps people become a lot happier, you know, even when they're ill. You know, mm. you, can be Ill and, you can be ill and miserable or you can be ill and happy. Mm. And miserable people die 14 years prematurely, no matter what. You know, so best best murder in the world, isn't it? You know, yeah. you don't like someone, <laughs> yeah. annoy them to the fact that they're miserable for the rest of their lives. They'll die 14 years before you, no evidence. Yeah. But, but we're doing it to ourselves. If someone, mm. if someone upsets us and we allow them, and I say if, if we allow them to upset us because we have to let that happen, then, you know, we're drinking poison, hoping that it kills them. It's a, it's a point mm. of exercise. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, like, if you're stressed out and you're annoyed and you're not happy and you're getting wound up, it just wrecks your immune system. And you're more susceptible, like you said, to colds and flu. And it can just kind of escalate from there. And I think, like, like you said, happiness is, like, so key. And I think, uh, you know, people need to, I think, kind of tap into that and and realize you know trying to try and find out what does make them happy and i think like you said being around the right people is important as well and that can kind of influence you know how people think and how they act and like you said that that train you was getting on it was like you know you could have stayed with everything that was the norm to you and kept in that loop and it's that kind of fine line isn't it into the unknown and into growth and into change and all of that yeah, you know, it's, it, it truly is. And it, it's about applying yourself. It's about learning new things. It's about, my, you know, I, I want to be in control of what happens to me. You know, I don't want someone else to take control of what happens to me. So even though, I mean, you know, as you get older, you get more and more ailments. You've got to go and see the doc a bit, bit more often. But I take responsibility for part of that. 
I take responsibility for my well-being very seriously. So I do things that I know are beneficial to me, you know, like the meditations and everything else I do. I don't just leave it to the docs because we're, we're living in a society now where over 90, 95 probably percent of, of illnesses are related to stress. We're living a very stressful lifestyle. We, we as human beings weren't designed to live like this. People's fight and flight response is, is on automatic all the time now. And if we think about the fight and flight response, if you look at an animal, like a, if a cat walks across your garden and it, and it sees a threat, it will arch its back, it will snarl, uh, the hairs will stand up on its back. And as soon as that threat's gone, it'll go back to normal and walk off. So the fight and flight thing kicks in, threat goes away, the cat forgets about the threat. As human beings, we're walking around as though it's a threat all the time. The saber tooth tiger's everywhere. And the body and the mind was never designed for that. It's meant to see a threat, trigger the fight and flight response, either fight it, you know, nullify the threat, hide or run away from the threat. And then when the threat's gone, it shuts down. In the way we live our lives today, it's constant, constant threat all the time. You put the television on, you hear news about COVID, it worries people, it's a threat. It's a saber tooth tiger. People, you're in your car, you're probably, probably going to meet people with road rage later on. You know, someone uh, cuts them up, God, the whole world's come to an end. You know, the saber tooth tiger's there. Uh, and it doesn't shut off. And this is where a lot of illnesses are coming from you know, because they've got this thing on automatic all the time. It's never designed to do that. When you when you practice something like positivity or you do mindfulness meditation or self-hypnosis, whatever you want to call it, you opt out of that. You have to opt out of it to do that. And the interesting thing about the pathways in the brain is a neural pathway cannot take a positive and a negative thought at the same time. Mm. All right? It can only take one. So if you do more negative than positive, you get more, more negative pathways than you do positive. If you do more positive than you got negative, these cancel them out. You know, because you can't you can't do both at the same time. So the more you practice positivity, mindfulness, meditation, self hypnosis, whatever you want to call it, the more those cell networks in the brain come together, and the stronger you become, and and the more the more it becomes a default option. Mm. Yeah, no, that's powerful, isn't it? Um, and I think it, like I said, it's it's so fascinating with you know, how the mind works and, you know, how, like you said, with the neurons, how we can cancel out, you know, negative neurons to, to you know, we're positive as well. And you see that in some people sometimes, like people, like I said, might go, oh, that, that person's not happy or X, Y, Z. Like I said, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because if they're in that kind of frequency and they're thinking most negative thoughts, they're not going to have as many positive, like you said, because they're, they're being cancelled out. And, I, I've worked in like hotels and hospitality and that's, you know, pretty stress, stressful. And like you said, the, it's not just on social media and uh, the internet and the news, it's everything else in between as well. And I, I remember work, I won't mention names, but I remember working with certain people in those environments and, you know, there was stress, their, their responses are firing off because so many things happening. And then, like you said, that person might finish work and then watch the news and get stressed out by something else. And like you said, it's this kind of cycle, isn't it, where people just need to have that kind of space and time away where they can kind of, you know, pra practice a bit of mindfulness or meditation, whatever that is, to kind of help them amongst everything else. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good point you make because, you know, you, there's people that are in jobs that probably don't enjoy what they're doing. So they, they hate being at work or they hate doing what they have to do at work. But if you're, in, if you're in a situation that you can't control, then you have to control your attitude to it. So you choose whether it affects you or not. Now, Viktor Frankl was a guy in, in the Second World War, he's a Jewish guy, and he, he survived three concentration camps. Most of his family, I think all of his family died, I think apart, apart from one person, if I remember right. But he, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he said, everything can be taken from a man, but the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances and to choose one's own way. Now that's quite a powerful thing because if you're in a concentration camp and where he was, he said the Germans could just pull you out of a line and shoot you. You, you had no choice over whether you lived or died. He used to be in a shed with, with 500 people in winter time where they'd be living in their own urine and excrement and have to go out and, and plow the field, uh, work the fields with no shoes on, freezing cold. And he said, you know, when people are gonna die because they, they would just give up. He said, now we had no control over that. He said, so we had to control our attitude to it. And that's what he did. And, and he, he developed a system of therapy called Logotherapy. And it's a very successful thing. And I, I would recommend anyone read his book called Man's Search for Meaning. 
And after the war, when, when he was practicing his therapy, people would go to him and they say, oh, do you know what? I really feel depressed. I feel a bit down. And he'd go, okay. And he wouldn't give them tablets. He'd, he'd prescribe, but they go and work uh, in, in an end of life center. So he, to go and work with people who were dying. Because he's like, if you think you've got it bad, mm. go and work with these poor people who haven't got a choice. You know, because mm. he, he'd seen the worst that humanity could do to, to man. So for people who are in a job they don't like, uh, who, who find the job stressful, yeah, it's going to happen. But you've got to choose how you choose to respond to what happens. If you don't do that, then your emotions are hijacking you and, you, and, and, and then you become addicted to that emotional state. If you take that pause and you think, all right, that's happened, let me think about this and I'm not going to let it affect me. I'll do, I'll do whatever, a, a more positive thing. You've got that choice. Now you, you can imagine Mick, Victor Frankl being in a concentration camp in the second world war and a German soldier looking at him the wrong way and that annoying him. If you turn around and went, look at me like that again, I'll punch you. It, he's got, he can't do that because they'll just kill him. You know, so you have to take that indignity, but he didn't see it as an indignity. He thought, right, that's what's happened. I'm not going to be judgmental on this. I'm just going to deal with it the best way I can. And my choice is not to rise to that challenge. Otherwise they're winning and I, mm -hmm. I lose. So it's, it's really important. And it's particularly in the climate we're in right now, you know, because people are, are worried, people are scared, people are losing their jobs. Some people are in jobs that they don't want to be in, you know, but it's what you choose to do in those circumstances. If the circumstances are set for you, then you've got no choice apart from control your attitude, control how you choose to think. If you don't do that, then you've given away your last freedom. Mm. Yeah, no, exactly, and I think that's that's, that's the really good points, and I think it's it, it's it's important, like you said, that people take control of their their lives and their mindset um, by you know making that choice and making that decision to not do those things that they don't like or those things that are causing them sh stress, and to you know kind of identify what it is and choose where their focus wants you know needs to go, mm -hmm. and. Um, it, it's, it's amazing story. Yeah, so you, you mentioned the word stress a couple of times. What, what is stress? Because mm. if you think about what, what, what stress is, stress was something they used to, to measure the, the breaking strain of certain materials. But people say, I'm stressed. So they're calling it a behavior. Okay. They're, they're saying they suffer from stress. So it's now an illness as well. Okay. Mm. They say, this thing causes me stress, this job or that person causes me stress. So it's now the source. So how can stress be the source, the behavior and the illness? It can't be all three. We've overgeneralized it. Stress actually isn't bad for you. If you didn't have stress, you, you wouldn't get up in the morning, you'd be dead. Mm. But there's good stress and there's bad stress. So you've got you stress, which is good stress, and you've got distress, which is bad stress. Mm. They just lump the whole lot together. I mean, you can go to the doctor now and say, doc, I feel a bit stressed. They'll ask you three questions. Then they'll sign you off with, with, with I know I'm a qualified stress consultant, you know, so I know how to do this. <laughs> but you've got to identify what stress is because 95 of, of percent of people who are, who are suffering from stress are getting ill. They're getting seriously mm. ill. So it's causing the illness right? mm. and it's causing the behavior. But how can someone cause you stress or how can an animal object make you stressed? What it is, is we don't like the situation or we don't like the circumstances or we don't like the person or we don't like what's been said. So we choose a response that's a negative emotional response to it. And that is now being classified as stress when actually, you know, it's, it's our attitude towards life and it's the choices we make that make a difference between, between, you know, living and dying fundamentally at the end of the day. Hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's a really good point as well. Like you said, like stress has kind of been blown out of blown out of proportions are the right word. And, you know, like I said, there's good stress and bad stress and, I think sometimes um, if, if, if I've seen sometimes people on the podcast or um, I had to do something yesterday and I, you know, it was kind of like nerves and it wasn't, it wasn't kind of like stress, but it was like, it was kind of like um, kind of a good, you know what I mean? It's kind of gives you that energy and that boost into what you're doing. And I think it's kind of how you leverage that, isn't it? It's totally, like if you go yeah. for a job interview, you know, that might be you know, stress or, you know, nerves but it, you know, it's kind of sometimes good to kind of use that. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, you know, I've done public speaking. I, I've done large events in the past and yeah, before you go on stage, you, you get, you get a bit anxious, you know, and, and you think, oh, you know, I don't want to make a fool of myself here, but that's a driver. I see that as a driver, not as a hindrance, because if I didn't have that, I wouldn't perform. 
You know, I'm one of these people, if, if I've got a presentation to do, I'll, I'm, I'll leave it right up to the last minute. Because if, if I try and prepare that presentation two weeks before, I've, I've not got enough drive to do it. The night before, I'm working on that presentation because my mind's in the game and I can focus on it totally and I'll get the thing done. So I work better under stress, if you like, but that's a positive mm. stress, not a negative stress. It's a use stress, not a distress. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's kind of what I've learned with podcasting as well. Like I'll, I'll make bullet points or I'll like, you know, do um, kind of a little bit of research or something the day before. But if there's someone I'm interviewing and I make lots of different bullet points and lots of different questions, I just feel more, I feel, like I said, that, that, that stress because I'm overthinking it and I'm not as present, if that makes sense, if I've got all those questions. Yeah. So and I that don't do that. That's back to saying earlier on about living in the moment. Mm. You know, if, if you're doing an interview and you've got to start thinking about what do I ask him, what do I ask him, what do I ask her, and thinking about what, you know, what do I do next, then you're in the past and in the future, you're not in the present. And that's mm. time wasted. That's time, you know, so you, you're doing a great job. I mean, I know a lot of this is free flowing and it's brilliant the way you're doing it, and you're becoming a master at your game. You just got to keep doing it. Mm. Oh, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate yeah. it. No, you're welcome. It means a lot. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm on social media like you are, I'm on all, all the platforms, and I see you regularly putting out content. And the content you're putting out is good. You, you're interviewing interesting people, you're giving a lot out there, and it will come back you know, it will come back. You just keep on doing it. You just keep on doing it and, and it, it's going to reap benefits for you. It's like, it's like the seasons, you know, when, when a farmer wants wants a crop, he's got to plant, plant, he's got to prepare the soil, plant the seeds. He's got to wait for it to grow. He's got to nurture it. And, and then eventually he gets a crop. Now we live in a society today where people want to plant a seed and get a crop straight away. It's just the nature of the way that people expect to live their lives. It doesn't work like that. It, you've got to put the time in and do the apprenticeship to get the thing done. And you're, you're there, my friend, you know, you are certainly pushing some good stuff out. Oh, thank you, Mark. It really, really, really means a lot. I really, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm really humbled. And I, I think like it, it, for me, it's been a learning curve because I mean, I've said it a few times. I've, I've liked to kind of hit the ground running. I like to be confident, you know, straight away and to be, to be there. And I think through podcasting, I've learned a lot about patience. And like you said, that process that it takes time and um, that kind of growth process, you know, and feeling, you know, feeling vulnerable and kind of accepting that. And just like I said, being patient, more present because it, you get better. I, you know, I find you get better with the things that you do most that are uncomfortable and things like that. Yeah, people people mistake vulnerability as being a weakness when vulnerability is actually, actually the other side of the coin of, of courage. Vulnerability and courage are the same thing. You know, if a soldier stands up in war and, and moves towards the enemy, they say that's courage. At that moment in time, they're vulnerable. You know, so mm. you, you doing this stuff and other people who do this stuff who put themselves out there, they're, they're vulnerable because there are keyboard warriors and there are naysayers that, that, are, that are quick to sort of, you know, put something negative on there ignore them if that's if that's all they have to do in their lives that's fine you know let them crack on with it but mm. as you develop the strength of your vulnerability that vulnerability will give you your wisdom that will give you your patience and all of that combined is courage because that's that what you know courage is a combination of a load of factors mm. but if, if anyone said to me oh he was brave and felt no fear i wouldn't want i wouldn't want to be in a battlefield with a person that's like that because they're going to mm. get you killed you know mm. you want to be around people who are vulnerable but willing to expose that vulnerability for the greater good of others Mm. it's the same in business yeah. it's the same in podcasting it's the same in what you're doing you know mm. going through that vulnerability and doing it is, is true courage my friend yeah no I thank you Mark I, I really appreciate it really yeah. means a lot and and I think as well like in that field of things like you must have like you know kind of been in situations where you know like maybe and things like that or certain predicaments where you know like you probably in life you come across people and they've kind of got that kind of mindset where they you know, that no fear kind of you know attitude and i think like you said it is kind of reckless isn't it if, if somebody's going into like a war zone or situation with that kind of attitude because you're not kind of looking at you're not thinking about what could be happening yeah well Lof lofty wiseman eh? there's lofty up on the wall up there by the way is, is a yeah long, longest serving member of the uh, special air service regiment he'll tell you he'll tell you himself he said if if if, if someone told me they had no fear he said I, I wouldn't want to work with them he said because they'll be they'll be reckless and he, he tells a funny story he tells when you go into jump school um to, to learn to parachute 
there's a big sign there and it says knowledge dispels fear and he said i must have been the thickest person there he said because i was petrified he said i was going to jump out of an aircraft with a parachute above my head he said so i must have been really thick because I, I was completely petrified but <laughs> you overcome that fear by doing it and the more you do it the more you overcome that fear and in, in the personal safety world you've got to have fear there because fear is something that we're given it's a gift we've been given by whoever created us or whatever created us to enable us to actually anticipate threat so if someone has no fear how can they anticipate threat everything's you know everything then to them will be a threat where you can't specify a threat you've got you've got no perspective on stuff so you know if, if you're walking down a road at night and you go past an alley you think oh i'll take a shortcut down that alley uh, to get home quicker or wherever you're going and all of a sudden you start to go no this doesn't feel right that's your sixth sense that's your body saying this isn't a good idea and you need to be able to tune into that and actually take notice of that and then go the other way but if someone hasn't got fear if they say they haven't got fear and they don't have that how will they know that not to go down that route so we have everything for a reason mm. yeah no, that's a really good point as well and i think like it's that kind of like I say that sixth sense of that like street wiseness isn't it i think I like to think that I'm, I'm pretty streetwise, but I think, you know, growing up in like a city for 19, you know, 19 years, 20 years, and then being in certain, you know, environments or situations, you know, at school and things like this. And it kind of, kind of all kind of comes together to your experience in life, isn't it? And yeah. sometimes people say to me, oh, well, you know, you should have gone to a different school and things like this. I'm like, well, those experiences kind of made me who I am. And I kind of, see things in a certain way kind of you know because of those experiences you know you have to kind of watch your back and you know if you get involved in fights or things like that you know it's kind of i think there's like that kind of balance you know you don't want to be uncomfortable and on the defense all the time because I, I was a bit like that when i was at school you know because of those situations but now i'm a lot more you know leveled out but you know i've got that i kind of like i said that kind of street wiseness and i can kind of pick up on things if that makes sense mm. yeah you know and everything's happening for a reason you know and when people say oh well you know you shouldn't have gone to that school you should have gone somewhere else that, that's a wish you can't do anything about it you were there you know at that moment in time that's where you were thinking about you should have been somewhere else doesn't matter it's it's irrelevant in your in your life's history because it's done and dusted you know and you learn from it you know, we, we are the sum total of our experiences in life. And, we, and uh, you know, we are the sum total of the way we choose to think. You know, we, we are what we think about all day long. And that thinking is defined by the experiences we've had through life. So if you can learn from experiences and have a positive output from that, what a great learning experience that is. Because everything has a meaning. And if we can find a meaning to anything, then it gives it more, more power and it gives us more wisdom. And that's why Frankl named his book Man's Search for Meaning because he was in a concentration camp, but he, he found meaning. He said, I was meant to be here so I could serve other people and save as many lives as I could. Um, and if he can do that in a con or three concentration camps, we, we've got no, no excuse. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. It's a good, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Mm. And um, like as well, I was thinking, um, do you, do you have any role models or anyone that you kind of like look up to, like mentors, anyone anyway, that's professionally or like personally? Yeah, loads so, of them. Um, I mean, well, mate, so many. Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, you know, Martin, Martin Luther King, these sort of people, Gandhi, you know, they had amazing abilities and foresight, you know. Christ, Muhammad, all these people, you know, these prophets were, were phenomenal. They, they, they knew about quantum mechanics and quantum thinking thousands of years ago. You know, the Buddha, phenomenal. You know, I love, I love Buddhism. You know, their, their teachings, their, their, their principles, the, the way they choose to live their lives is fascinating. The things they can do with it is fascinating. And personally, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got role models. I mean, you know, John Steadman was, has been a fantastic friend and brother and, and mentor to me over the years. Lofty, Wiseman, brilliant. You know, and everyone but to be honest with you everyone's a teacher you know everyone i meet has the ability to give me something and i, I can learn from everyone so yeah I, I, i've i'm grateful to virtually everyone that's come into my life including yourself because yeah. you know we i've had the ability to learn and interact and, and and you know in many cases befriend people who've been friends with mine for years mm. yeah yeah no exactly and i think like as well you know you can take kind of something you can learn something from like I said everyone can't you, you can kind of mm. take something and yeah, I think I think like I said, we're all kind of here for a reason. There's a purpose behind it, yeah. um, and as well, like 
do you, I know you mentioned a few books. Like, is there any favorite books that you like to read at all? Um, yeah, um, Full Catastrophe Living by John Cabot Zinn is one. The Art of Happiness by Dalai Lama is another one. Um, Norman Vincent Peale's book on positive thinking. Uh, I've got so many books. Um, I've actually, I'm looking over at the arm of my, my armchair over there. There's four yeah. books on the arm of my armchair over there right now. Um, thinking Big is one there. So I, I read a range of books. I read books that are philosophical, positive mindset stuff, you know, books on Buddhism, the just mentioned on meditation. And I read business books as well. You know, I, I like books on marketing and business development because there's a psychology to that too. And what's interesting with a lot of the books on marketing, if you look at the psychology behind it, there's a couple of streams you go down. One is the one where you try and manipulate someone to buy something. And the other one is you say, you know what, let's just be, be, let's just be good and help this person get to where they want to go. And that's that aspect of psychology for marketing is what I enjoy the most. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think, I think it's really important to read books. I'm, I've got lots of different books I've bought because I'll be reading one. I'll see one on Amazon. I'll be like, I'm going to buy that now. Um, try not to do that so much, but I think like you can take so much, you can take there's so many things to be taken from reading isn't there in, in books and you can yeah. apply it to your life and also you know you, you've got to have the power to believe in whatever you want to believe in whether that's a religion whether that's a faith whether it's in your own ability to succeed whatever that is you've got to you've got to start from the position that you believe it um, because if you start from the position you believe it the networks in the brain come together and you get a physical representation of what you believe and yeah you know, I, I was watching something with morgan freeman this, this morning on, on the telly and he was talking about does God exist? And a lot of people say, well, you, you've got to take that leap of faith. Um, and you, you've got to believe in God first for before you can actually understand it. And I've heard people have a counter argument to that saying, oh, well, that's just blind faith. And you, you know, you're going to believe in a God without any proof. But one guy I was talking to was a scientist said a really interesting thing. He said, well, he said, I look at it like this. He said, when I when I met my wife, he said, we decided to get married. He said, I didn't ask her for proof of love. He said, I knew love was there. He said, and I, I took a leap of faith as she did with me and we got married and that love in our relationship has grown he said so when i became a christian i took a leap of faith he said and now my faith has grown because of the love i have for god now that's sort of from religious burden now some people might think oh yeah but i don't want to get to the religious side don't if you want to be successful if you want to be happy if you want to live the life you want to live then you've got to take that leap of faith in your success because one of the things I know about the research I've looked at is when they talk about God and they talk about the kingdom of heaven and all this sort of stuff, it's inside you. We all have this divinity inside us. And I can't remember if we did it on our last podcast, if I'm repeating myself, I'm, I'm going to put it down to the fact I'm 60 and I've got dementia, so I'm going to get away with it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I interviewed a priest, a Roman, a Roman Catholic priest, an Anglican minister and, and a Buddhist. It's, it's, not, it's not a joke. I did. And I asked them, I said, you know, where, <laughs> Where's, where's the kingdom of heaven? Is it, is it up there somewhere? And they said, no, no. And they quoted scripture to me and said, the kingdom of heaven exists inside you. Because uh, when one of the disciples was asking Jesus, he said, no, the kingdom of heaven exists inside you. I said, right. I said, and we're made in God's image. They went, yeah. I said, so the person who created the heavens and the earth and your belief systems, I said, he made us in his image. He went, yeah. I said, right. I said, so if, if we have this kingdom of heaven inside of us and we're made in God's image, we have the ability to create anything. They went, yeah, you're a, you're a creator. That's what you put you on the planet for. So I then said, well, did he, has he got a sick sense of humor? It's God. I said, does he intentionally give us the ability to be dysfunctional, to screw this up? Because if we have all of this goodness inside us, all of this divinity and this ability to create, does he throw a spanner in there to give us a dysfunction so that we, do, we learn not to use it? And it's the only time the Buddhist spoke. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you have to work hard to do that to yourself. Hmm. Yeah. So if you think about the power you have, 60 to 100 trillion cells in your body doing 6 trillion things per second, yeah, 400 billion neurons in your brain, which is equal to the amount of planets and stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Why have we got all this stuff? It, it, you know, it's not just there so we can watch EastEnders and understand what the actors are saying. You know, it's, it's there to help you do whatever you want to do with your life. It's there to help you leave a legacy, to go and build stuff, to, to affect other people in a positive way. You know, it's not there for you to walk down the pub with your earphones in and just zone out you know and, and mm -hmm. use alcohol to excess because you can't put up with your day or think negative thoughts and get depressed and then say it's everyone else's fault all of us got the ability here to achieve great things we can't control the environment sometimes we can't control what happens to us but we can control what we choose to do about it and our attitudes towards life that's the power we've been given 
No, exactly. And I think like it's so it's so powerful, you know, what you what you just said. And I I believe in, you know, what you said and I, I it's so true. And I think like it just shows you, doesn't it, that we've been given all this kind of um what's the word? This kind of like inner, inner potential to create whatever it is that we want to create. And there's there's far more power to us as people than kind of what we let off sometimes probably you know like i said just going to work and watching tv these kind of things and you know like we all do that and i think it's like you know, there's nothing wrong with that there's like, that kind of balance with doing that but i think there's like i said there's more to life than during you know finding that alcohol is the cure to what how we're feeling and not being happy and i think like there, there are ways that we can go about it to change our lives if we really kind of want to and we've got all that you know within us yeah it, it it's it's all there you know i mean um one one doctor did a study and 79 percent of, of medical students studying to- tropical diseases get the symptoms of the disease they study so they're, they're reading up on, on a tropical disease and they end up getting the symptoms of the disease that's the power of the mind that's focus for you so what you mm-hmm. focus on you end up getting more of you know it, it, it's a phenomenal thing and one thing you should do because you you're smart enough and young enough to do it why don't you set up an eight-week mindfulness session for people get them mm. to join you on that and change some yeah life. yeah could do could do I, i've been i've been looking at doing like i, I did put, put a thing off like a three-day course um doing like working on like different things but i it's definitely something that i i you know in the well what you like to say what i'm doing now yeah do yeah yeah no definitely yeah yeah, I've got someone else. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to put you away for an interview as well. I've just thought of mm. something. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it, Mark. I mean, anyone that you have in mind, I, I'd be happy to. And um, no, definitely. And I've got I've got a few people in mind, you know, for, for yourself as well. If you if you did want to do a you know a podcast on anyone else's as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah, if you want if yeah. anyone else to talk to me, I'm more than happy. I mean, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sad here. So if anyone wants to, wants to interview me, they're more than welcome to ask. No yeah, problem yeah. at all. No, it's great. But um, but that Mark, it, it's it's um, it's been an absolute pleasure, like having you back on the podcast and, and talking to you again. And um, I I really appreciate you know the support that you kind of you know give me and like coming on the show. And I think as well, like I said before, we recorded that you was my third podcast when I, when I started and I looked back at the day and it was January, January 25th. So like, you know, quite a while ago. And, um, you know, you kind of gave me that kind of confidence and that, you know, that, that belief in myself that, you know, I, I could, you know, do podcasting and do this. And I, I really thank you for that and kind of give me that support and that, that encouragement with, with doing this, you know, and, and it really means a lot. You're welcome, mate. I'm just glad I can help. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. Otherwise your mum will come and beat me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. My mum's, she's uh, I think she's quoting your book as well, isn't she? she um, but, but no, definitely as well. Like, where where can people like find your book? Like, where can people get your book? Like, oh, it's, it, it's it's on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're actually bizarrely, I, I don't know why, but we had a run of them um recently, so we're just waiting for new stock to come in. But you can, they can get it on Amazon Amazon uk. It's all up there. Um, if they want to, if they want a PDF version, get them to email me. I'll, I'll email them back a PDF version. I'll send you the link actually, and you can put it out with the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. No. Of course, I'd be happy to do that, yeah. and uh, and I'll and I'll share and I'll promote it as well for you. And um, uh, where where can people find you on like social media and your website and that kind of thing as well? Oh, I mean, the website's nfps.info, so if people are interested in the, the aspects of what we do from a training company, physical restraint, self-defense, all that sort of stuff, um, nfps.info is the website. If they come on a course with, with us, they, they get a load of this on the first morning of every course, so we, we, we do a, go teach them about the mindfulness stuff and all the, all the, the thinking stuff. Um, but I'm on Facebook as well. You can Google me under Mark Dawes or NFPS Limited on Facebook. I'm on there. We've got a youtube channel twitter Instagram, all the usual stuff we're out there so just just stick my name in i'll, I'll pop up yeah no of course and i'll and I'll, and I'll put it in the link for you and uh share your content as well brilliant all right mate thanks well listen right. if i can help anyone that's what i'm here for yeah no awesome Mark. but uh no it's been a pleasure talking to you again and i wish you all the best on what you've done brilliant thanks Alan. take right. care mate you're welcome take hey, care are you finished